All right, well, this is my first time at, at UMass and definitely came at a momentous time. Uh, it's very different from when I was on campus uh, during the peak of American hegemonic unipolarity during the 1990s at the University of Pennsylvania. I think my classmate was Ivanka Trump. Uh, <laughs> Don Jr. might have been there too. Um, and I, rem I remember my first campus protest um, I went down on Locust Walk to the center of UPenn and everyone was there, everyone. They were outraged, but they were kind of standing around. They didn't know how to protest. Like all the normies were there. And I said, what happened? Why is everyone so angry? I've never seen a protest in all my years here. I was like a senior. They said they banned beer on campus. So that was, uh, yeah. I mean, the, the one time I saw a line around the block for a speaker at UPenn, it was for Warren Buffett. So, that's, you know, that's what university administrators became accustomed to over the years. Um, there, were, there were no problems, there was no friction, there was no criticism, uh, and that's what they want you to be. They want you to go back to that time. <laughs> they don't know, they don't understand the era that we're living through right now, the administrators. They don't know Manu Shafiq, the chancellor here. They don't know what they've walked into. Um, they don't have a sense of history like you do. And so they expected you to put conformity before your conscience. And when you actually do the opposite, then they project their own values onto you and say that the reason you're doing this and freaking out is because you're not having enough sex. They're literally saying that on all the networks. They can't accept that young people actually have principles because they don't know anyone in their hermetic political echo chamber who actually does. And they definitely, they don't know anyone who's willing to sacrifice their ambition and their career for something that they truly believe in for their own humanity, which is why they think their threats will actually work. They're not working. So we're living through, thanks to this uprising, this national uprising, which has been years and years in the making, we're living through the ultimate mask off moment in America. Um, and I, I, I feel like I've been a part of it for, for years. I was part of the first generation. I lived through, I went on a birthright Israel trip after I graduated from college. They say, you know, we'll, we'll build a lifelong connection between you and Israel. And they did with me, but in a way they didn't quite expect. <laughs> Then the second intifada jumped off and I watched the siege and destruction of the Janine refugee camp. 2006, Israel assaults southern Lebanon, destroys the Dahia district, southern Beirut. I watched that. 2008, Obama's elected. I struggled to summon excitement as I watched him say nothing as Israel assaulted the Gaza Strip in the first of its major assaults on a besieged Gaza Strip. And by 2015, I had returned from the Gaza Strip, my first time there, actually witnessing the second major assault on Gaza, being under the bombing and speaking at University of Michigan's first major divestment hearing and seeing how this movement was really developing. And what we're seeing now is, I wouldn't even call it the culmination, but it is the, the, the product of so many efforts by so many students over the years. Um, and the, be, the, the boycott and divestment movement, which was once sort of dismissed as a sideshow, is now changing this country and threatening not just Israel, but all of our elite institutions. It's ripped the mask off of our elite institutions, the most august institutions of the liberal democratic West, the legacy media, academia, the universities, the Democratic Party of Clinton, Obama, and Biden, the America First movement of Trump has been exposed in many ways as kind of an Israel first racket. And so we just see this hilariously hypocritical system in, a, in the throes of desperation trying to stop this movement before it expands. We are also seeing the historical narratives that form the foundations of Western exceptionalism uh, being revealed as hollow in a way like never before. And this is all due to what I call the October 7th effect, which 
show which has exposed the control and influence of Zionism over so many of these institutions, and Zionism as a contradiction within American imperialism. Now, after the U.S. adopted its special relationship with Israel in 1967, it tried to enforce the view, and we heard this particularly during the 90s when the peace process began, that Israel was a Jewish and democratic state, <clears throat> the only democracy in the Middle East, the only democracy, and that it would end its illegal occupation of Palestine eventually as soon as it found a partner for peace, which it could never find among the Palestinians who never wasted an opportunity to waste an opportunity because they were given so many generous offers. Uh, this narrative was necessary not only to justify the billions of dollars of aid extracted from us and given to Israel, uh, but to paper over the influence of Israel's domestic cutouts and its influence over our institutions. We would just shrug it off as shared values. Hey, this influence is actually positive. There's nothing unusual here. Um, and so we're now at a point where Americans and particularly the core constituencies of the Democratic Party, see the real Israel that has always been concealed from us. It's the Israel that I wrote about in my book, Goliath, which was sort of the product of five years of trips in and out of Israel-Palestine, particularly going into Jewish-Israeli society. This was between the years of, of 2009 and, or 2008, 2009, and, uh, and 2013, uh, 2014. And what I saw was a society that was primed for genocide. And that was the, my warning to America as we bankrolled that society and granted it with total impunity, showed it that there was no consequence for what it was preparing to do and for the indoctrination of so many Jewish Israelis into this militarized system. Now here we are after the killing of some 40,000 people there's so many undocumented dead in Gaza under the rubble. How, we, will, we don't know how many there are, but we're seeing mass graves revealed almost every day. That's the, the, these, are, these are tokens of the real Israel, which has failed in Gaza to achieve its two main military objectives, defeating Hamas and liberating its so-called hostages, captives, and prisoners of war. Many of them are soldiers. And so what it's done is resorted to the industrial slaughter of children in order to satiate the bloodlust of a hyper-indoctrinated population that was humiliated on October 7th. It could not accept the latest ceasefire that Hamas accepted for its own political reasons. One, the linchpin of Israel's ruling coalition are two of the biggest fanatics in Israeli society who represent the incipient Jewish nationalist force which will soon take control of the entire government. Itamar Ben-Gvir and Bezalel Smotrich, both uh, disciples of the late American fascist rabbi Meir Kahana, whose nephew just attacked a, pal a Gaza encampment, uh, ramming through stu um, protesters with his car. It was a direct connection. Um, if, 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 if Netanyahu had agreed to that ceasefire, these two characters, who control a total of just four to five seats in the Knesset, would have brought the ruling coalition down in a second. They need the war to continue. The entire war cabinet has elected to invade Rafa. It's happening before our eyes. We're seeing people be slaughtered at an increasingly high rate because it's a conurbation of 1.5 million war refugees, mostly living in tents, mostly to the west of the city. Um, and they have nowhere to go. Inside Israel, if there's any resistance to this invasion, it's coming from people who are concerned correctly that the hostages will be killed because they only care about the lives of Jewish Israelis. There's no concern for the lives of Palestinians. There's over 80% Jewish-Israeli support for this invasion uh, within Jewish-Israeli society. However, they're divided on the issue of the hostages and what many are saying correctly is that the hostages will be killed as an extension of the Hannibal Directive that we saw enacted on October 7th in order to deny Hamas political leverage. If they kill all the hostages, Hamas has no bargaining leverage, no ability to negotiate. 
That's how deep the culture of killing is. They will kill their own in order to destroy Hamas and complete what was begun in 1948. This is an existential war for Israel. The siege of Gaza enacted almost 20 years ago and all of the impending military rampages that we've seen since then were designed to preserve Zionism according to the logical contours of Zionism, whose survival is predicated on the violent engineering of a Jewish demographic majority. That's something that none of the leaders of Israel would deny. Uh, Arnon Sofer, he's not particularly well known, but he's an important figure in that he helped design the siege as a demographer at Tel Aviv University. Um, and he distilled the essential logic of Zionism when he said in 2004 in an interview with the Jerusalem Post, when 2.5 million people live in a closed off Gaza, the pressure at the border will be awful. So if we want to remain alive, we have to kill and kill and kill all day, every day. That is the logic we're seeing play out before our eyes. So this week, the vice president of Netanyahu's Likud party, Shimon Boker, said there are no uninvolved civilians in Gaza and then directly echoed Arnon Sofer from 20 years ago. You have to go in and kill and kill and kill. And we've heard that from so many of the Israeli leaders. These are not like aberrations or fanatics. They are distilling the logic of Zionism as applied to the reality today in Israel-Palestine. What decent person could possibly, who, who knows the facts? I mean, you all know the facts, or most of you. I mean, those of you who are Zionist infiltrators don't, but the most of you. <laughs> What decent person who knows the facts could possibly support a country that needs to commit genocide in order to survive? Thank you. I mean, <laughs> that's pretty much what this movement all comes down to, this uprising all comes down to. And so more and more Americans are joining it. And it's clear that as they join it, from within elite institutions like academia, that America's mask of liberal democracy has to peel, be peeled back again and again and again, layer after layer, in order to maintain a special relationship with a foreign apartheid state 5,000 miles away called Israel. This is I mean, what, unprecedented waves of police violence. What, uh, how many cops were you here last night? 130 arrests, 125 cops. Uh, Fashion Institute of Technology last night, 300 cops for something like 30 to 40 protesters. A bear cat smashing into Columbia University's Hamilton Hall. A cop discharging his handgun. Uh, just full on brutality. But it's not just that, it's political repression. The First Amendment is being systematically rolled back in order to protect a foreign state. This is exactly what President George Washington warned about in his farewell address when he warned of a passionate attachment to a foreign country which would corrode America from within. So you don't have to be a radical. You could be an American nationalist and be disgusted by what's happening. The U.S. is corroding its own image, its own carefully crafted image, its own as an exceptionalist shining city on a hill, as Ronald Reagan called it. This is the source of the soft power that undergirds American imperialism and allows America to export its political project abroad. It is corroding it in order to accommodate the imperatives, the genocidal imperatives of Zionism and everyone in the world can see it, except in Germany. <laughs> and this is not something new. It's something I've been covering, been writing about, and you all, have, many of you for much longer have been witnessing this process. It played out under Trump. It played out under every other president. Um, Obama may have forestalled the inevitable, even though he oversaw a more disproportionate force against Palestinians than any previous president, but this is part of a historical process.
but now it's reached sort of its culmination under the president who, um, yeah, under who I call President Puddenbrain. <laughs> Joe Biden, who was hailed for his decency at the White House Press Correspondents Association dinner. Completely delusional. Who is Joe Biden? Is he, what, what, I mean, what is Joe Biden? Who controls him? No, you know, that's perhaps, I mean, he's had a good, he's, he's gotten some good work done. I, I might benefit from whoever did his hair at some point. But we're not here to make fun of, we're not made here to, to mock looks of Biden. The reality is Biden, okay, he started out as a right-wing Democrat who opposed school desegregation. He comes from that background. He wound up on the, at a fairly young age on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. And in 1982, uh, the Senate Foreign Relations Committee had a meeting with then Israeli Prime Minister Menachem Begin, uh, the founder of the Likud party, sort of the uh, godfather to Benjamin Netanyahu, who um, would eventually become a junior minister. And Ronald Reagan and the Reagan administration was actually furious at Menachem Begin for invading Lebanon. Reagan called this invasion and the civilian casualties caused by Israel a holocaust. Those were his words. Everyone on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee was furious at Begin. They were, they were worried about actually what it would do to US imperial interests in the Middle East, including getting the oil. Biden was the lone exception on the Foreign Relations Committee. He get, stood up in a private session, this was reported by the New York Times at the time, 1982, and told Begin, you should go in there with full force and not be afraid to kill women and children. I would do the same thing. So that was the young Joe Biden. And over the course of his career, Joe Biden, who said that if Israel didn't exist, we would have to create it, very revealing comment, has took, taken in more donations from AIPAC-related donors than any active U.S. politician. There are others who are retired who took in more, but Joe Biden took in the most. And that's who he's turning to for his re-election bid. And that is why he accused you all of blatant anti-Semitism. That is why on Holocaust Remembrance Day, he accused Hamas of ancient desires to kill Jews. And if anyone knows about ancient desires, <laughs> it's Joe Biden. In January, Joe Biden broke all fundraising records with a $42 million fundraising haul. And it was purely through the sheer force of his charisma and mental acuity that he did so. No, it was actually because he took in a large percentage of that at the home of someone named Haim Saban, a Hollywood mogul who is the, one of the or the top individual donor to Biden, to Bill Clinton, to Hillary Clinton, and to Barack Obama, and who said, I am a one-issue guy, and my issue is Israel. He's a literal Israel firster of Israel heritage, Israeli heritage. Um, his wife, Cheryl Saban, got a um, vanity uh, position as UN uh, liaison under Barack Obama because he donated so much money to Obama. She is a, I mean, and no offense to Playboy bunnies or anyone, but she, that, she met him when she was a Playboy bunny. She did not have a career in diplomacy is all I'm saying. So this, this is it. This is what it all comes down to. Biden is controlled by figures like Haim Saban, just as Donald Trump is controlled by figures like Sheldon Adelson, who's not even alive, uh, but who controls much of the Republican Party through his widow, Miriam Adelson, and the Sheldon and Miriam Adelson Foundation. Uh, Trump also is a vehicle for Israeli influence through his son-in-law, Jared Kushner, who was the son of a major Zionist donor, Charles Kushner, who is very close to Netanyahu. And this is... This has been reported in the New York Times. When Jared Kushner was a boy, Benjamin Netanyahu, he was, was opposition leader of Likud. And after meetings with AIPAC and various bigwigs, 
Netanyahu would stay at the Kushner's home and Jared would have to get out of his bed and Netanyahu would sleep in Jared Kushner's bed. So, Netan uh, so Trump's son-in-law is literally in bed with Netanyahu. <laughs> Trump's ambassador to Israel, David Friedman, who called me the biggest anti-Semite in the world. I guess I'll take it as a badge of honor. Um, I call him the reciprocal ambas U.S. Israeli ambassador. He, you know, he is someone who is on the board of, actually oversees the Bet El Foundation, which is the foundation, the charitable foundation for an illegal ultranationalist settlement in the occupied West Bank. This is a U.S. diplomat and he's been overseeing the um, attempt to dislodge UPenn's administration because they are not anti-Palestinian enough. Sheldon Adelson has been the leading donor to Donald Trump. Just look at Donald Trump rolling out the Abraham Accords and Jared Kushner is over his shoulder, Netanyahu's in the front row, and to his left was Sheldon Adelson, casino baron, and to, along with his wife, Miriam. It's not the only candidate that he exerts influence on in this campaign. RFK Jr. has come out with a very strong, we could call it pro-Israel line. It's essentially a genocidal line filled with misinformation, malinformation, and disinformation, as they call it. Um, he had agreed to debate me and pulled back from that. And one thing I really wanted to ask him about was his relationship with the Adelsons and with Shmuley Botia this reality show rabbi who you've all seen um, stoking anti-Semitism by his sheer existence. Um, well, Shmuley is the Adelson's bag man. Shmuley courted RFK after RFK made comments that the vaccine had possibly been, uh, no, that COVID had been possibly engineered to um, exempt Asian and Ashkenazi Jewish people from getting infected at a private dinner which was, you know, someone from the New York Post recorded that. RFK gets in trouble. Shmuley starts attacking him as an anti-Semite. Then RFK meets with Shmuley, and Shmuley says, look, we can make this whole problem go away. You just do an event with me, and we, we help you out a little bit. You just have, we're going to feed you the script. And all of a sudden, RFK appears as even more hardcore, more Netanyahu than Netanyahu. You know, he says the Palestinian Authority has a pay-to-slay policy and they pay you to kill a Jew anywhere in the world. Recently, very below the radar, RFK finally did, RFK Jr. finally did an event where he was on stage with world-renowned philanthropist Miriam Adelson to raise money for Shmuley Botiak's security detail. So it's clear what's going on here. And so Trump is supposed to be the lead figure in the America First movement. America First is all about American sovereignty, protecting our borders, not getting embroiled in unnecessary foreign conflicts. Most of the America Firsters correctly opposed the $65 billion in aid to Ukraine, which was just money washing for all of the uh, defense firms, the weapons contractors, uh, and was designed to prolong a fruitless war. But they all wound up supporting the Israel aid, which was attached to it. So by the time this vote came to Congress, Donald Trump was found strategizing with Lindsey Graham, the ultimate neocon in the Senate, who said that America First is actually about giving all of our money to all of these other countries to project American strength. America First basically died on April 20th when Donald Trump, Lindsey Graham, and Speaker Mike Johnson collaborated to give all of this money away to other countries whose interests diverge deeply from the real interests, including the imperial interests of the US. That date will be more harmful to Donald Trump among his own base than January 6th was. However, we're seeing contradictions in American nationalism emerge. Figures like Candace Owens, a key Trump influencer who has flown by Sheldon Adelson to the inauguration of the moving of the U.S. Embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem has split with Netanyahu's top podcast influencer in the U.S., Ben Shapiro, and ho wound up hosting Norman Finkelstein for an hour-long talk to just learn more about Palestine. It's very interesting. 
And what it came down to was that she had had four children and became disgusted with all of these images of children being killed. It's affecting them too to the extent that they can get over partisan, get over their uh, partisan brainwashing and tap into their own humanity. Tucker Carlson, immediately after October, the top pro-Trump influencer, immediately after October 7th, warned of war with Iran. War with Iran does not, in his view, and in the view of American nationalists, does not advance American interests or the, in, or the values of America first. And later, he noticed that Palestinian Christians exist, something that many, many American nationalists do not know. That, for example, St. Porphyria's church, which dates back to the 5th century AD, was under siege by the Israelis, was having its parishioners killed by Israeli snipers. He was watching that, and he decided to host Munter Isaac, a reverend of the Evangelical Lutheran Church in Bethlehem, who is known for his deeply moving sermon on Easter, Christ in the Rubble. That, watch that interview. It was 45 minutes that was a complete demolition of the logic of Zionism and a major blow to the Islamophobia industry by simply presenting another kind of Palestinian who was living among Muslims in harmony and whose community in Bethlehem was being destroyed by U.S.-backed Zionism. So we need to encourage these contradictions. These are beneficial contradictions for this movement. And so I'll leave it to you to ponder that. I'm not going to offer any advice here. Um, but it's obviously the Democrats who deserve the most disdain because they're the biggest hypocrites, because they're the ones who take you for granted. They're the ones who say that they're for diversity, equity, inclusion, DEI, and they're the ones who ultimately are ensuring that Palestinians D-I-E. It is sickening to see the same people who have those signs on their lawn that say Black Lives Matter and uh, love is love and science is real bow down before apartheid and the church of Zientology, as I call it. I remember I was at, I was at this uh, event in Washington, uh, just to troll it, um, sponsored by Palantir and Lockheed Martin, uh, called the Truman National Security Project. And they groom Democrats, particularly minority Democrats and LGBTQ Democrats, to get into national security positions. And they openly stated at this event that we need a more diverse national security uh, core in or, and you know, more personnel of diverse backgrounds so that we can sit down with China and Russia and say, hey, uh, we, you know, we have people who speak your language, who look just like you. We can sit down with South Africa and we can be stronger at the negotiating table. In other words, um, we can advance US empire in a more diverse fashion. And this sort of uh, speaks to the essence of what the U.S. State Department is about. It's about what Tony Blinken has called the rules-based order. And this is something else that has been unmasked by this movement and by what I call the October 7th effect. The rules-based order is simply a means of projecting U.S. soft power diversity, and all the values that the Democratic Party claims to espouse in order to subvert international law. No one here can tell me where the rules are written. There are no rules in the rules-based order. It's just a phrase to mean a kinder, gentler, or at least prettier and more diverse American imperialism. And it's been completely destroyed by what the U.S. has done in Gaza, I mean, I, I go to the State Department briefings every once in a while. It's the best unintentional comedy mic in Washington. And you have this increasingly cartoonish cast of spokesmen explain to the press. I, I remember I was there and they were explaining how the State Department lo, um, legal team has reviewed Israel's conduct in Gaza five months in and determined that Israel committed no violations of international law. I mean, who can possibly take the State Department or the rules-based order seriously when that's what's taking place. 
two weeks ago, I was there and uh, Saeed Arakat, who's the lone Palestinian journalist, one of the bravest journalists in town, um, asked the backup spokesman, Vedant Patel, if the State Department could condemn Netanyahu's demand that the US literally send troops on college protesters. Um, he said, was this meddling? Is this foreign interference for a foreign leader to call for a kind of Kent State style massacre of US students in order to protect his government? Patel was under orders not to condemn or criticize Netanyahu. He could not defend America, American students against a foreign leader calling for them to be mowed down. And when Patel's not there, the main spokesman is uh, you know, nicknamed Smirkula, Matthew Miller. Um, I, I, I confronted him right after October 7th. It was, uh, you know, I think it was October 10th, October 11th. Israel had, gone, had begun just the process of destroying, completely razing Gaza City. And Israeli officials were beginning to call for Nakba 2.0 to declare that their intention was to commit genocide. And I said, can you condemn any of these statements? And Miller smirked at me and then lit into me with full consternation that I was ignoring what had taken place on October 7th and Israel has the right to defend itself. We need to look at the personnel at the State Department because many of them are controlling Joe Biden in many ways, someone who doesn't have the capacity to exert control like he used to. Miller, he's controlling the messaging in a lot of ways. He's the former spokesman for Bob Menendez, who might be the largest recipient of all time of APAC money, who's going to jail now likely for um, taking gold bars from Egyptian lobbyists, like the stuff, you know, like rappers bite into. Like it's not even like the slick, you know, give me some crypto donations or just deposit something in my bank. He literally walked out with gold bars in his jacket and he's going to jail, but he had been on corruption trial on a corruption trial before for a similar bribery scenario, and APAC donors mobilized to pay Bob Menendez's legal bills. 100% of his legal bills were paid by APAC. Then you have Tony Blinken himself. I think Tony Blinken is the most influential figure in this scenario, basically playing Israel's lawyer in all of the negotiations. He forfeited all diplomatic leverage when he went to Israel on his first trip and declared that I am here as a Jew. Can you imagine like if we had a Muslim uh, Secretary of State and they went to Pakistan as a Muslim, what that would do to relations with India, for example? Uh, he doesn't play diplomat. He doesn't have to. He says openly that I, he said this at an APAC meeting in 2007, I inherited my commitment to Israel's strength from my family. And who is his family? His, you know, no one should be blamed for the sins of the father, but if you're gonna say that, then we should know who your family is. His grandfather authored one of the first and most influential studies, or no, uh, sponsored one of the first and most influential studies on the feasibility of the colonization of Palestine. I think it was published in 1937. Tony Blinken's father-in-law, who raised him, is Samuel Pissar. He was the fixer for Robert Maxwell. Robert Maxwell, who was a de facto Mossad agent who received a state bur de facto state burial in Israel, even though he was spent most of his life in the UK, and was the father of Ghislaine Maxwell, the last call to Robert Maxwell was from Samuel Pissar, Tony Blinken's father-in-law. And who was Ghislaine Maxwell, the wing woman for Jeffrey Epstein, who likely himself was an Israeli agent in some way. Um, Tony Blinken lives in a giant mansion on Chainbridge Road in suburban Washington, DC. And there is a 24 seven protest encampment that's been going on there since the, you know, since the winter. Uh, extremely brave people who, uh, you know, suffered through rain and cold and harassment 
uh, are there to remind Blinken of the genocide that he's presiding over. And who paid for that mansion? It was the boutique consulting firm that Tony Blinken runs called West Exec Advisors, which has as its clients many Israeli spy tech firms. So we need to ask ourselves, how much money is Tony Blinken going to make off this genocide when he walks back through the revolving door? Jen Psaki, Jen Psaki is benefiting and has benefited from literal Psaki bombs. Uh, not, not literal, I don't know. They said that when she was the White House press secretary. She dropped a Saki bomb. As she, after she, uh, between the time she was White House press secretary and State Department press secretary, she was a consultant for West Exec and consulted for an Israeli spy tech firm. And now she's over at MSNBC, um, one of the media organizations that has helped manufacture consent for this genocide. So it's, a, it's been a major mask off moment for the Democrats, the Republican America First movement, the State Department, the rules-based order, and now it's the media. Everybody is seeing how the media manufactured consent for genocide, and now they're trying to walk it back. Now they're finally showing us what's been going on in Gaza after they reported days after October 7th lies furnished to them from the Israeli Prime Minister about 40 beheaded babies which appeared in a CNN Chiron for one hour. And Sarah Seidner from CNN declared that we have received confirmation of these 40 beheaded babies from the Israeli Prime Minister. <laughs> it's like saying I have, revealed, I have received confirmation that the odometer of my used car has not been rolled back from the used car dealership owner. 40 beheaded babies, a fetus cut from a pregnant woman, um, uh, um, young 12-year-old uh, twins burned alive by Hamas in Kibbutz Berry. All of these were revealed as lies. We're not denying that atrocities took place, but Israel decided that in order for it to, uh, it needed to guarantee politi enough political latitude for if it, needed, if it was to get the political latitude it needed for genocide, it had to go big. And so they deployed heinous atrocity propaganda and it revealed how much our media is willing to act as stenographers for this apartheid regime. And it was really thanks to independent media outlets like Mondo Weiss, like Electronic Intifada, and I should say like the Gray Zone, that we were able to actually push back the culmination of this uh, media propaganda festival took place on the pages of the New York Times in December when Israel was getting desperate and it was getting disappointed that the core constituencies of the Democratic Party were beginning to lose faith in their narrative. And so they went even bigger and declared that Hamas had carried out systematic sexual violence on October 7th, committed acts of mass rape. They put forward the narrative, then they set out to find the facts. And, this is, and, and Israeli propaganda operatives began distributing testimonies and connecting journalists with a, mostly anonymous figures to journalists across Western media. And that's why we see so many similarities between the various specials and front page reports that we saw, for example, in The Guardian by Bethany McKernan or at CNN by Jake Tapper or in the New York Times, which I'll talk about in a second. They were all so similar because they were all feeding from the same Israeli trough and they were all duped as we have exposed. It's now gotten to the point where that New York Times article Screams Without Silence, which has been debunked from top to bottom with every source exposed, including with family members of the supposed victims coming out and declaring that the New York Times had manipulated them and lied. It's gotten so bad that the Washington Post finally broke the veil of silence and reported on the scandal at the New York Times because 50 tenured professors, most of them, uh, communications, journalism professors have issued a letter calling for the New York Times to retract this article, Screams Without Silence. They made their fall person, Anat Schwartz, who was the co-author of that article, who had never written an article before, had no journalistic experience and had been liking calls for genocide on Twitter. They fired her. 
They didn't fire her nephew, noted food blogger Adam Sella, who was another co-author, and Jeffrey Gettleman, who previously fabricated a quote by the late Zimbabwean president Robert Mugabe and faced no consequences, has not been fired. And so the New York Times finally faced accountability, though, for articles like that, for constantly using the passive voice when reporting on this genocide. Um, Doctor finds bodies in Rafa, that kind of stuff you're going to see today in the New York Times. They finally faced accountability when this week they were awarded a Pulitzer Prize for their coverage of Israel-Palestine and particularly the war in Gaza. The New York Times won the Pulitzer. And guess who oversees the Pulitzer Prize? Which institution oversees the Pulitzer Prize? Columbia University. <laughs> so it's the ultimate mask off moment. And of course it is the, the, the mask of academia of the most August academic institutions has never been lifted like this before. Um, Senator Tom Cotton, who is substantially funded by Zionist billionaires like Sheldon Adelson, like Paul Singer, has said that little Gazas are sprouting up on campuses across America. I don't take, I think that's, I don't take that as a bad thing. I, I, when I was in Gaza, it was one of the greatest places I've ever been, so let, let, a, th let a thousand Little Gaza's bloom. I mean, the bravest, most dignified, and warmest people I met were in Gaza. We really don't deserve them. Um, but let's go with Tom Cotton's logic, because in a way, he's right. Those little Gazas, which are filled with critical thinkers across campuses around America, are surrounded by big Israel. The university administration, the university police, all the weight on universities, and especially the trustees. I don't have time to go through all the trustees on all the campuses where there are crackdowns, but let's take Ohio State University, uh, where brave students attempted a Gaza encampment and were immediately brutally crushed by Ohio State troopers. Ohio State University, it's, it seems like it's a state university. It's the alma mater of my uh, my grandmother, she was able to go to a public university as a second-generation American. It's not really public, though. It's, it's almost completely owned by someone, longtime CEO of Victoria's Secret, which relied on prison labor, named Les Wexner. Who's Les Wexner? Epstein's wingman. Epstein was flying into Columbia Airport so much that uh, you know, he became on first name on a first name basis with the uh, you know the airport staff. Les Wexner was plausibly accused three separate times by one of the women, Virginia Jufre, that Epstein trafficked. And as these allegations poured out, Columbia, Ohio, and Ohio State Press started reporting on it. And a scandal ensued at Ohio State University. And nothing happened because Les Wexner has donated over $120 million to Ohio State University. And that's all that matters. And so he's still basically the chair of the trustees. And the other trustees constantly complain that he actually still dictates who gets to sit in the other chairs through his fortune. That's Ohio State University. Les Wexner pulled $2 million out of Harvard to help guarantee the demise of Claudine Gay after another Zionist donor, Bill Ackman, came for her head, along with Larry Summers, former economic advisor to the Clinton administration, uh, former head of the World Bank who said that, said that Africa was underpolluted. Columbia University. Manu Shafiq is the is fairly new dean there. President, sorry, president. I think she's the first Ivy League president of Arab heritage. Um, so she you know, is historic, and she therefore is sort of the perfect person to push around. Um, she also holds a seat on the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and helps, apparently helps uh, guarantee Bill and Melinda Gates donations to Columbia Medical School. She is a channel 
for big money after coming from the London School of Economics under a cloud of controversy after they had a major sexual abuse scandal at that school. She is a baroness in the UK, and she is essentially risen to the top by serving elite interests. But behind her, if you look more carefully at the Board of Trustees at Columbia, you see Che Johnson, former head of the Department of Homeland Security in the Obama administration, who currently serves on the board of Lockheed Martin. And he, according to a num number of people um, at Columbia I spoke to, including I just spoke to a Columbia student protester who's involved in organizing, they believe he is the one sort of coaching and um, Manu Shafiq and managing the situation. According to that student, they have demanded that Columbia declare who, which companies it's invested in, and they have refused to provide any transparency at all. As these student protests continue, we have heard from Palantir CEO, the head of one of the major private spying companies on the planet, at a conference yesterday of intelligence professionals and military honchos in Washington someone who provided targeting to the Ukrainian military. He said that these protests have become an infection in America, that they have to be stopped, and that if we don't win the war of ideas, we being the national security state with these students, we will never be able to deploy armies in the West again. He's right, and that's a beautiful thing, but let's kind of interrogate what, he, what he's saying there. Uh, yes, he's panicked, yes, he's paranoid, yes, he's getting desperate, but what he, what he means is if divestment actually starts to go through at major campuses, then it will spread to other elite, powerful institutions and American companies, unions, and then there will be no money to pay for this imperial military whose budget is something like 20 to 30 times the budget of the Russian military or the Chinese military. And then the corporate welfare will stop flowing to contractors like him to help maintain the empire as well. The whole thing will be dissolved and America will become not an empire, but possibly, I don't know, a republic, a slightly more normal country. <laughs> and that's something they can't have happened. So understand how important this movement is by the words of those who seek to crush it. They, and it's, so he said, we have to win the war of ideas. They've already lost the war of ideas. We can see that. We saw that here last night. When you lose the war of ideas, that's what you do. All they have left is force. That's pretty much all they have left. And so now we're seeing the mask lifted on our law enforcement agencies, which for years and years have been training with Israeli apartheid forces. I mean, in 2012, we reported at the Gray Zone that one-fifth of all members of the Minnesota Police Department were trained, had, had gone, undergone Israeli training programs. Georgia State University, they have trained thousands and thousands of cops through their Jilly program. Small uh, campus uh, police departments in Massachusetts have undergone training by Israel. Avi Dichter, the former head of the Israeli Shin Bet, he came to the US back in 2007 for an FBI conference. He was the keynote speaker and he said, we need to understand that what we're fighting, what you're fighting in the US is crime terror. Crime is terror and you have to treat it like terror. They're trying to impose an Israeli way of thinking, an Israeli logic to Ameri onto American policing, and they're lobbying police officials to think their way. And, and, I'll, and, I'll, and I'll, I'll just, uh, I'll name and shame a few of them really quickly. The NYPD counterterror unit was exposed by the Associated Press in 2011 for not only maintaining an office in Tel Aviv, but maintaining a so-called demographics unit. You, you know, the language that Israel uses towards Palestinians to monitor Muslim communities. And they were not only monitoring Muslims in New York City, 
on New York campuses. They were targeting Muslim students at Yale University and Rutgers University, far away from New York, who had been involved in Palestine solidarity activity. And they still maintain an office in Tel Aviv. The liaison to that office was someone named Rebecca Weiner. She was their Middle East liaison. For the new, and she rose to head of the, the deputy director of New York, New York NYPD's counterterror and intelligence <laughs> division, and was credited by Eric Adams in the day after press conference, after the militarized raid on Hamilton Hall at Columbia University, with helping to direct that raid. She directed that raid from inside Columbia University as a adjunct professor at Columbia's School of International and Political Affairs, SIPA. So that just shows you how compromised these institutions are, that the professors are actually part of the law enforcement system that's directly liaising with Israeli intelligence and spying on students and cracking down on them. This is shocking. It should be a major scandal. It's not. Nor is the fact that police stood down at UCLA for four hours to allow a Zionist mob to attack those students brutally with pipes, with pepper spray, ripping older women's hair and assaulting them, and, hit, and uh, firing Dodger Stadium level pyrotechnics at those students. Well, they already did it at Columbia. They had two former Israeli soldiers at Columbia University months ago attack students with skunk spray. Fifteen students went to the emergency room, and did they get kicked off campus? No. Were they arrested? No. So it's that impunity that influenced that Zionist mob to attack people, and there have still been no arrests. No arrests. Uh, at the Gray Zone, we obtained a a dossier that the students have sent UC campus police identifying several of those protesters. Uh, and it's indisputable evidence of their identities, yet no arrests. The LA Times today reported that the LAPD is now going to use January 6 tactics and advanced AI systems to finally identify them. It's been like well over a week. You know who they are. You can go get them. And they have hired someone as a private consultant to help oversee this process. His name is Charles Ramsey. He's the former, I know him because he's the former head of the DC Metropolitan Police where I live. And um, basically when Charles Ramsey was police chief, all of a sudden the police start cars started going everywhere with their sirens on at all times. And I looked into why this was and it was because he went on a training trip to Israel and learned that you establish deterrence by having the sirens on at all times. So they're bringing in a cop who was trained by Israel to arrest, to oversee this uh, process of holding Zionist hooligans accountable. At every level, we find Israeli influence, which is why no one's being held accountable. So they have force, and then they have the anti-Semitism allegation. That's pretty much all they have left. Anti-Semitism. Where is, it? is there a surge in anti-Semitism right now? Because I was just invited to a Shabbat at George Washington University. It was being held at the Gaza encampment. It just didn't feel really anti-Semitic. It felt like, uh, it felt, you know, kind of like a, a, a beautiful be-in. Uh, then they did a Good Friday prayers. Who's causing anti-Semitism? In many cases, Zionist forces are just simply making it up because they need it so badly. They're simply inventing it. The ADL is literally inventing anti-Semitism by counting a Palestine solidarity demonstrations as anti-Semitic incidents, which is why, according to them, there's been something like a 300% rise. Over 50% of anti-Semitic incidents, which they counted, according to the Jewish Daily Forward, are Palestine solidarity demonstrations and slogans being belted out at those demonstrations. They need anti-Semitism because anti-Semitism is the fuel for Zionism. It's the fuel for Israel's occupation. It's the justification for Israel's existence as an exclusivist Jewish state. It's why Israel, the Zionist movement broke the Jewish boycott of Nazi Germany in the 1930s and began negotiating with Nazi Germany. There's always been this relationship, this symbiosis there. The, the uh, Zionist movement brought Leopold von Mildenstein 
who was the head of Hitler's Office of Jewish Affairs, the boss of Joseph Goebbels, on a tour of Kibbutzim. And he admired Zionism so much that he was given him that he created a special medal with a Jewish star on one side and a swastika on the other. Nineteen in, throughout the 1950s, Israel fomented anti-Semitism in the Arab world. Um, as uh, David Hurst, the British journalist, documented in his book *The Gun and the Olive Branch*, the a Zionist underground movement staged bombing attacks on Jewish communal centers in Baghdad in order to compel the Iraqi Jewish community to move to Israel. Same thing happened in Egypt, the Levant Affair, uh, which really should have been called the Ben Gurion Affair. Ben Gurion wanted uh, the British to come back and take control of the Suez Canal, and so uh, Zionist or Israeli spies carried out bombing attacks in Egypt. They were unmasked as Egyptian Jews, and it led to every Egyptian Jew being held in suspicion by the security forces and the end of Egyptian Jewry. They all had to go to Israel, so this benefited Israel. And it continues and continues to the present where we see uh, anti-Semitic hate crimes be revealed as hoaxes. A student from Yale University stabbed in the eye, a complete hoax exposed on video. She turns out to be a professional pro-Israel agitator. Stickers that appear throughout New York that declare rape is resistance with a Palestinian flag. A complete Zionist hoax. No one has ever seen them or promoted them except their influencers. You might not remember it. I don't know, some of you might remember in 2017 this wave of bomb threat calls to Jewish community centers. Who was arrested? A Jewish Israeli youth was arrested for those calls. Very mysterious. So anti-Semitism is actually being exposed as a weapon in order to justify genocide, which is particularly dangerous, I think, for Jews, because when real anti-Semitism rears its head, no one will believe it, and you can increasingly see the real anti-Semites are proud and believe that they're free speech heroes. And have you noticed that actual anti-Semites, people who actually hate Jews, the influencers are being welcomed back on Twitter X while Elon Musk is simultaneously heeding the Israel lobby's calls to suppress just the slogan, from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. What's going on here? He, is he setting the stage? Is the Israel lobby setting the stage for coming in to censor the rest of us on Twitter on the basis of the presence of these anti-Semites? So it's only one side who is amplifying and spreading anti-Semitism. And the Holocaust and the legacy of Jewish persecution are becoming instruments of repression, which is especially dangerous. Look at what Richie Torres did. This is one of the Israel lobby's biggest tools in Congress. A openly gay Puerto Rican from the poorest district in the US, the Bronx, who spends much of his time in Israel, spends very little time in his district, co-sponsor of the Anti-Semitism Awareness Act, where the government officially declared criticism of Israel to be anti-Semitism, which essentially declares the inverse, that Judaism is Zionism, which is something that anti-Semites say in order to implicate all Jews for Israel's crimes. Josh Gottheimer from New Jersey, another <laughs> Israel lobby tool, is teaming up with the Holocaust Memorial Museum to provide a curriculum for elementary students on October 7th. They're going to ram Israeli propaganda down the throats of American students. How do you think they're going to respond to that? Today, Representative Virginia Fox and the House GOP have been hauling in kindergarten teachers for not being supportive of Israel. Literal kindergarten teachers from K through 12 in three districts in the U.S., including Montgomery County from near where I'm from. And Aaron Bean, Representative Aaron Bean, said that kindergartners are spewing Nazi propaganda. And this is reaching levels of in uh, sheer insanity. On this, during the same hearings, Elise Stefanik, whose entire career is basically based on hyping up bogus allegations of anti-Semitism, falsely stated that students in New York chanted, kill the Jews. The principal in that school countered that there was no evidence for this allegation. So it's yet another Zionist hate crime. What we need to do is just simply say that we will not allow 
paid off Zionist lobby tools and the whining of pampered pro-Israel students concocting hate crime hoaxes to drown out the guttural cries of the children who are being scorched with US weapons paid for with our tax dollars in Rafa right now. And we have to amplify those cries and ignore the hoaxers. I've been talking the whole time about um, what's happening here in the US, what's happening in the West, but we have an obligation to maintain a focus on Gaza, where the Islamic University has been blown up, where Isra University has been blown up, where schools have been occupied by Israeli soldiers and vandalized, where 15,000 students, children have been killed, where the main organization for educating those students, UNRWA, has basically been banned and is being defunded by the US government on the basis of media lies, Israeli lies, complete uh, another hoax, where intellectuals, doctors, have been captured and tortured, have been killed, where my friend Rifat al arir was assassinated, for his words, for his words. This is the message that needs to be reinforced on campuses, is that business as usual cannot continue here when these campuses are invested in the mechanisms of literally assassinating intellectuals and academics and medical professionals and students and destroying the educational facilities of an entire population. I also should note that Rifat al daughter was just assassinated by Israel. His daughter, whom, to whom he um, dedicated his compilation, Gaza Writes Back, um, he wrote in the uh, dedication of that book that he hoped that one day his daughter Shaima could meet his um, host, his Jewish host in Berkeley, and her daughter, Viola, uh, that she could someday come out of Gaza and meet the people who hosted him. R Rifat was a special person, and his words have become uh, sort of, uh, they've filled the Gaza encampments. Uh, particularly his, his poem, Let It Be a Tale. Um, and uh, you know, I got to know him before the first time I went to Gaza. I was one of the anti-Zionist Jews that he got to know, and he talked about how he had an anti-Semitic kind of mentality before because the only Jews he knew were in F-16s or operating drones, were occupation soldiers. He had no opportunity to see another side of Judaism. Um, and that changed him. And he actually wound up bringing anti-Zionist Jews to his classes at Islamic University where he taught English to meet his students who had never met a Jew, period, who didn't want to kill them. Um, he's someone who should be revered, but he was someone who was demonized in, the, in a um, column by a former New York Times columnist, Barry Weiss, painted as a Nazi, had his direct messages fill up with threats from active duty Israeli soldiers telling him they planned to kill him. He received a phone call from the Israeli military while he was sheltering in a school with his family, telling him they were going to come for him. He went home and they assassinated him. And in his last interview with the Electronic Intifada, Rifat said, as you could hear bombs falling behind him. You could hear the shelling. Uh, and he was shaking. I can't tell you what it's like to be under the bombing. I could barely psychologically cope with it for just two or three nights that I experienced it. Uh, he said that they may come for me. Soldiers will come for me. I don't have a gun in my house. I don't have anything to resist with. But if they come for me, all I have here is an Expo marker. And I'll throw the Expo marker at them. I will resist to my last breath. And what he's saying is that there's something that everyone can do. And that's what you're doing here. Even if you just have a marker, you have to throw the marker. So that's all I have to say. I don't have any advice for you except to throw the marker. 
Throw the marker at the administration. Throw the marker. Throw the marker at the at the Israel lobby. Throw the marker at the Biden administration. Throw the marker in Chicago because sem the semester is almost over here and we're going to have to go somewhere with this. But there's something that everyone can do. That's really the essence of the BDS movement. That's the essence of this rebellion. And so don't stop now. Thank you.